Wonderful. Well, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Anderson, and I'm the uh, director of the American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative. It's a position that I've held for just four weeks, so this is something of a coming out party for me. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you for what promises to be a very important discussion uh, of and sharing of lessons learned in the criminal law reform area. Thank you for those of you who are here. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are joining us via the web, I am told that you can uh, post questions to us all uh, throughout the morning, um, either by commenting on the live stream page or via Twitter using the at ABA rule of law moniker. Um, and hopefully that will be clear to all of you who are web savvy. Uh, we convene today against a challenging time for rule of law. Later this fall, we will mark 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it seems like uh, an appropriate time for some stock taking. We ourselves here at the ABA will mark our own silver anniversary of rule of law development work next year. So we take a moment to pause and evaluate our successes and failures, our progress made and work to be done. What do we see? A very mixed picture. On the one hand, in many countries in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, there is steady progress toward increasingly strong judiciaries, democratic institutions, independent bars, and vibrant civil society. At the same time, there are other very worrying recent developments, closing space for civil society and media, the armed conflict in Ukraine, and threats to the independence of the bars and judiciaries in several countries in the Balkans. These developments underscore that the road to democracy and good governance is long and winding, often characterized by two steps forward, one step back. Some might despair and ask, why bother? It's hopeless. 25 years of democratization assistance, and this is what we've got? The answer, I think, is that we've got a lot. To be sure, there are no guarantees that we won't have those steps backward. But in the form of the resilience and capacity of legal actors and institutions to respond, to take that next two steps forward after one back, we have come a long way. We know well from the history of any democracy that this is an iterative process and that rule of law institutions are critical. Our own Supreme Court here in the United States took one of those two steps forward yesterday, 200 years into our rule of law development effort. And it is um, particularly important in challenging times like we face now in Eastern Europe that we maintain steadfast support for our reformist colleagues in civil society, in bar associations, in the judiciaries, and strengthen their capacity to bounce back and take those next steps forward. It is just such an effort that has affected one of our panels today. Many of you know that we were supposed to be joined today by our colleague Dragoljub Djurjevic, who is president of the Serbian Bar. Mr. Djurjevic had to cancel his participation in this symposium due to pressing work fighting threats to the independence of the Bar in Serbia. Attorneys in Serbia went on strike on September 17th to protest new legislation that threatens their profession and their independence. These new laws give notaries the sole right to prepare and certify a variety of contracts and agreements, including all agreements involving real property. It also allows notaries to represent clients in court on matters concerning documents or contracts prepared by notaries, a right that previously belonged only to attorneys. And attorneys argue this violates the Serbian Constitution. Now, this seems like, at, at minimum, a pocketbook issue for lawyers. Some of their business is being taken away. But it actually is uh, of greater concern for access to justice in Serbia. In no small part because there are only 100 notaries in Serbia with a population of 7 million. Moreover, uh, notaries in Serbia charge high fees to, uh, many, in many cases, higher fees than lawyers do. And citizens will have no choice but now to turn and pay these higher fees in order to get this legal assistance. Finally, notaries are also licensed and regulated by the Ministry of Justice rather than by an independent bar association. 
self-regulating body like the Bar Association. These developments, together with a new fixed tax on lawyers, levied regardless of their income and recently doubled, pose serious threats to the legal profession and in turn access to justice in Serbia. So it's understandable that as the president of the Bar, Mr. Georgievich, had to stay home and lead the effort to protect the independence and autonomy of the legal profession by advocating for repeal of these new legal provisions. Although we regret that he isn't here today, we recognize the importance of the Serbian Bar's work and of legal actors like Mr. Georgievich in responding to these challenges. And these developments in Serbia serve to highlight the importance of many of the reform activities that we will be discuss discussing today and how this work to develop that resilience of institutions is critical. In many ways, there is no more important arena for rule of law development work than our subject today, criminal law reform. The functioning of a criminal law system is a key litmus test for any legal system. And as we have seen from Ferguson, Missouri to the Fergana Valley of Uzbekistan, flaws in the criminal system provide fertile ground for unrest and conflict. And it's for this reason that for tw over 20 years, the ABA has made a, pr a priority of criminal law reform efforts. Investing in criminal law reform uh, throughout uh, the uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and in more recent years throughout the world. We are uh, much indebted to our donors who have made this work possible and I want to in particular uh, sp pay special tribute to USAID to the State Department Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, and the Department of Justice Office of Overseas Prosecutorial Development Assistance and Training. I also want to recognize our local partners on five continents without whom our programs could never succeed, and specifically acknowledge our partners in the Balkans, whose work we'll profile today, especially the Chambers of Advocates in Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Macedonia, and Serbia, and all of the members of the Balkans Regional Rule of Law Network that you'll hear about shortly. This event is part of the ABA's larger criminal law reform activities. Since 1995, these uh, programs have provided technical assistance to thousands of prosecutors, judges, and investigators, as well as to government ministries, training academies, and civil society actors. I see in the audience a number of veterans of those activities, and it's wonderful to welcome you back uh, here today. It's probably Rowley's work with the defense bar, however, which has been most critical in ensuring due process, fairness, and a balance of power between the state and an accused, and uh, in providing a foundation for authentic and effective criminal justice reforms. Our, our discussions today will provide an opportunity to really focus on this work with the defense bar and the lessons learned in a number of countries that have undertaken major overhauls in their criminal justice systems, including introduction of a more adversarial process. We'll ask an, uh, important questions like, does this tend to result in a more equitable balance of power? Increase the proactiveness of the defense attorney? What issues have arisen as countries have incorporated elements of the adversarial process into their criminal procedure? We'll explore this question in a number of different contexts, not just in uh, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and Serbia, but also in Rwanda and Latin America. Does the judiciary have the skills and confidence to effectively and fairly preside as a more neutral arbitrator in adversarial processes? Are there perceptions that the changes are resulting in overly powerful defense attorneys, too frequent release or uh, acquittal of the accused? increased crime rates, perceived higher crime rates, or justice only for the rich? In short, are these reform efforts working? Today's symposium brings together experts from all over the world to share their perspectives and answer these questions. And uh, I hope uh, that you will all join in a robust discussion and that those of you on the web will join in uh, as well. We'll begin with an introduction to ABA Rowley's flagship uh, uh, Bar Development and Support Program uh, in the Balkans, the Balkans Regional Rule of Law Network, and ABA Rowley's research on criminal defense in that region. Resources and materials about these programs, including this wonderful study, 
uh, comparative analysis of criminal defense advocacy in Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Macedonia, and Serbia it are out there by the registration desk, and I believe also available on the web for those of you who are remote. Um, and uh, speaker bios and other materials are there as well. So without further introduction, I'd like to turn it over uh, to the two uh, masterminds behind today's uh, program, Ashley Martin, who is our senior program manager uh, in our E&E, &E, uh, Europe and Eurasia uh, division, and Jesse Tannenbaum, ABA Roley Senior Legal Analysis in our research office. And one of the guilty pleasures of being a director of a program like this is that you get to take credit for the work of others, and I'm going to step away from that um, <laughs> or atone for that and uh, really uh, offering credit to these two who've done a marvelous job both in uh, these programs that you'll hear about today and also in, in organizing today's discussion. So, you. you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I think this is on. Um, good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Ashley Martin. I'm the senior program manager for the ABA Rulies Balkan programs. This morning, I'm going to provide a little background on. Is that better? Background on how to turn a microphone on, I guess. I'm going to provide a little background on the USAID funded Balkans Regional Rule of Law program why there's a need for this program, what the program's goals are, and what we've accomplished so far and what we hope to accomplish in the future. Jesse will then discuss a little bit more about the methodology of the comparative analysis that we conducted in our program countries. As Betsy mentioned, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Serbia, and Macedonia. The Balkans Regional Rule of Law Network began in September 2013. It's a USAID-funded three-year, $3.4 million program funded through the rights funding mechanism. As we all, many of us know, the countries in the Western Balkans have it been in a transition period since the early 1990s to a governance that's based on rule of law principles and democratic governance. This, of course, has been complicated by instability and conflict in the region. And justice systems in all of the countries have faced tremendous pressures and challenges from corruption, lack of funding, and the reform required for EU integration. As the criminal justice systems change, in many cases from an inquisitorial to an adversarial system, defense advocates fulfill an essential role to provide a check on the government actors, judges and prosecutors. Judges and prosecutors often receive training and support through their work as part of the government. We'll hear a little bit more about this in a video shortly. Um, defense advocates and private attorneys do not receive that kind of training. And yet, those actors, defense attorneys, must be equally competent to serve their roles if the adversarial system is to work. Bar associations and chambers of advocates, as they're, call, as they're called in many countries in our region, have the potential to provide essential support to defense attorneys as they take on their new roles, as well as the legal profession as a whole in each country. Um, although the potential is there, few bar associations in the region are well equipped to provide that support. <coughs> Excuse me. Many have only very recently received independence from the government's ministries of justice. Many don't have sufficient financial support from their members to develop professional opportunities to be effective defenders of their clients. A seek to provide a continuing legal education system, for example, or to advocate, like Mr. Georgievich is doing now, with the government on behalf of the legal profession as a whole. Some are operating in an environment that sees the lawyer as a business person or an entrepreneur, not as an officer of the court or an essential part of a functioning judicial system. Bar associations aren't the only private organizations with the potential to support these criminal law transitions. Um, through USAID and our work in the region, we've come to understand that although bar associations are the hub of lawyer communities, legal communities, Many civil society organizations in the region are tackling criminal justice issues with or without the support of bar associations. In some cases, this has led to a conflict as civil society organizations take on a legal aid function. But civil society's view often is that they're filling in a gap that bar associations and lawyers themselves are not able to fill. Jesse and I will speak a little more about the comparative assessment, um, comparative analysis and assessment in the countries of the program area. But in a nutshell, through that assessment, 
we were able to have a bird's eye view of criminal justice reform in the region and to see how bar associations in the region have met their unique and shared challenges and how we might help them to share those experiences and to gain, gain experience from uh, each other's hard earned uh, knowledge. This assessment that we conducted formed the basis for our May 2014 conference in Okhrid, Macedonia. During this conference, we interviewed many participants to get a better sense of the challenges in the region and how they saw the network facilitating their work with one another. We'll now see a brief video about the program in the initial conference. As we just heard from participants during the conference, network members were able to discuss the greatest challenges in their own countries and in the region as well. Um, this video, I think, illustrates one of the main pillars of our program, which was to create a truly demand-driven network through a participatory approach. We had the benefit of the bird's eye view through conducting the assessment, but we really worked to ensure during the conference and throughout the program that the final decisions on issues were with the program, the, with the network members. Um, as we learned in the video, the network members at the conference decided that the five greatest challenges in the region that they would tackle were legal aid and ex officio defense, bar chamber capacity, legal training and education, criminal law, and media and public awareness. The stakeholders at the conference also discussed the mission of the network and refined it to include views of what the network should accomplish in the next two years. Network members also drove the working group discussions. Um, we will also be working in the future on a website uh, that will go live probably early 2015, which will provide a forum for discussion and online resources for people in the network to gather information, share information, as well as to provide their fellow network members with information on what has worked and what hasn't. Um, in the future, each working group who, who are now meeting in October and November of this year, um, they will be using a several funding mechanisms to sort of tackle their, their major priorities. Uh, first, we will be giving subgrants to civil society organizations who work in the criminal justice field. We will provide legal specialist and expert expertise and then ABA Roley will be facilitating regional professional exchanges. If a network member finds that a bar association in Bulgaria, for example, has done a great job of providing continuing legal education, this program will be a facilitator for that regional exchange. During these, the meetings in the next two months, the working groups will also develop strategic plans for the coming year and figure out how exactly they're going to tackle their greatest priorities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our initial activity in the program was to conduct the comparative analysis of criminal um, defense advocacy in the region. So Jesse will talk a little bit more about the methodology of that assessment and the findings that we discovered. <coughs> Thanks, Dean Patrick. Um, I'll just talk very briefly about It provides an empirical basis for analyzing the strength, independence, and effectiveness of the criminal defense bar. Um, it relies on international human rights law and internationally accepted standards for the legal profession. Um, we used a rights-based right -based approach when we developed the methodology of the ACDA. Um, in a rights-based approach, the assessor examines the system to evaluate whether and how the holder of the rights, in this case the accused person, is served and empowered by the system, the system being the criminal justice system in this case. The rights-based approach ensures that the assessor considers whether and how the duty bearer, in this case defense advocates, are upholding their responsibilities. It also allows our assessment to highlight the role that defense advocates and a healthy defense bar have in upholding human rights. Um, oops. The ACDA evaluates local laws, regulations, and practices uh, vis-a-vis -vis 10 factors that 
reflect essential characteristics that contribute to a strong, independent, and effective criminal defense bar and correspond to a fair and functioning criminal justice system. Um, we divide the factors into three categories, three sections. The first is called the practice of criminal defense bar, and it has four factors, education and qualification, licensing and professional development, professional independence, and ethics, discipline, and immunity. Our section, second section is on the duties of lawyers and the rights of clients, and this includes factors on the lawyer-client relationship, protecting the rights of the accused, promoting access to justice. And our third section is on relationships with non-governmental criminal justice actors, um, and these include factors on professional associations of lawyers, civil society, and the media and general public. The factor analysis is based, as I mentioned, on international human rights law and internationally accepted standards for the legal profession. Um, these include standards produced by the International Bar Association and the International Commission of Jurists, um, Council of Europe um, guidelines for the legal profession, UN guidelines on the role of the defense lawyer and other material. Um, we gather information during the assessment through a review of the legal and regulatory framework for the bar and for the criminal justice system as well as interviews conducted with key stakeholders, including defense lawyers, prosecutors, judges, development professionals, civil society organizations, academics, and others working with the criminal justice system, including civil society. And the report presents an in-depth analysis of legal, institutional, and practical issues relating to each factor. Um, one unique thing about the ACDA, among um, ABA Rowley's many assessment methodologies, is that it can be implemented in whole or in part in a single country or as a comparative analysis in multiple countries as we did in the Balkans. Um, it also can include recommendations for reform, which we did in the Balkans. Um, the ACDA that we piloted in the Balkans, as, as Ashley's mentioned, was for Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Macedonia and Serbia, which are the five countries in our network. Um, we conducted 190 key informant interviewees. We had an assessment team of eight people for this five country assessment. And we did 190 interviews in three weeks. Um, we weren't all in the same countries at the same time. <laughs> um, we also conducted review of the legislation and secondary materials regarding the criminal justice system and the legal profession in those countries. Um, the findings and recommendations, um, the, goal, well, the goal of the assessment was to establish a baseline for the Balkans Regional Rule of Law Program by surveying the current state of the criminal defense bars and producing recommendations for programmatic interve interventions. And so the findings and recommendations of this assessment inform the agenda and the activities of the Regional Rule of Law Network. Sorry. Um, and we identified major challenges and strength in each strengths in each country and areas in which countries can learn from each other. Maybe one country was ahead of the others in a certain area. Ways that they can work together to develop. Um, and things that they're all doing well. Um, I'm not going to go, into in, go in depth into findings in the interest of time and you know, sustaining your interest. Um, we do have copies of our assessment um, at the materials table where you came in, um, as well as one pages if you're not interested in reading the whole publication but would like some more information about it. Um, but some of the major challenges we identified in the region included weak legal aid systems, threats to the independence of the bar, a lack of respect for equality of arms, and the implementation of new criminal procedure legislation in several countries. Um, I'd like to turn things over to our first panel. They'll certainly be discussing these challenges and others um, in the panel on criminal law reform and European integration in the Balkans. Good morning, or as we say in Romania, Bună dimineața. Uh, no, I don't speak German. <laughs> My name is Matt Benson. I currently work with the Open Society Foundation. Uh, and I'm joined by wonderful colleagues, uh, including uh, Søren Avanesian from USAID, uh, Meto Kuloski, uh, who's the president of the United Ma Macedonian Diaspora, and Mary Greer, whom I'm sure everybody knows uh, in the audience. And it's nice to see familiar faces in the audience as well. We agreed to have more of a conversation than presentations. Uh, and I'll be kind of sharp about time because we hope to have about 20 minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Um, Mary asked me to comment on two very quick issues. One was my work in Romania, which was pre-accession 
Uh, I was there for six years. Uh, I kept on going to Brussels uh, at the, uh, uh, to meet with the Committee on uh, Home and Internal Affairs, and I kept on saying they're not ready. And I was told, uh, it doesn't matter. The decision has already been made that Romania will join the EU. So the work is still ongoing uh, on all kinds of fronts. Um, also, my, in my current job, I'm working on pretrial justice. Uh, I keep on saying it's good to start from the beginning, particularly since all dysfunctions at the pretrial stage of a criminal case compound down the line um, and have an impact. And so, from the um, perspective of poor people tend to get poorer, um, abuses, corrupt, rampant corruption, um, and also lack of good representation and quality of legal aid or counsel, there is a lot to do and we're working globally, uh, with the exception of North Africa, which has its own problems as well. So that if some of you might have some questions about uh, the pretrial justice reform that we are working on. Hello. <laughs> um, I'll be happy to answer your questions after uh, the session's end. Uh, you have the bios of all of our speakers uh, today, so I'll let you find out about their prestigious uh, career. But let me turn to Meto and ask, um, given the uh, current EU policies, could you give us an update and talk about the problems that are being faced? Thank you, Madeline, and uh, thank you. Three minutes or less. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, uh, Madeline, uh, Mary, Elizabeth, uh, Ashley, Jesse, and Zlata, and everyone else uh, for organizing this event. I, I will uh, state that I am not an attorney. Uh, I don't have a legal background. Uh, I come as somebody who uh, has uh, worked in different uh, areas uh, on the Balkans in Southeast Europe and actually uh, several years ago uh, as a result of the diaspora, Global Diaspora Forum at State Department organized with USAID, we founded a Southeast Europe coalition which basically works uh, uh, with informal or sort of an informal body of organizations from the region working together uh, side by side on different areas, particularly EU uh, integration. Before I get into the question, I want to just uh, say that I have a, a enormous respect for ABA and Roli and, and its predecessor, Sealy, uh, in everything uh, that your organization has been doing on uh, legal um, and judicial reforms uh, in the Balkans. And actually, in my research, I discovered that Macedonia's first president, uh, in 94, Kiro Grigorov was awarded the rule of law, the first Sealy rule of law uh, award, which I had no idea. And in his speech, he said that by way of their suggestions, Sealy ABA, and proposals, it has made our transition period as smooth as possible. So I just want to commend you all on your efforts because I think uh, as a result, the transition period of all the countries in the region are much more smoother uh, thanks to ABA's work. Um, on the overall sort of EU, uh, the sentiments, I mean, you know, the enlargement has always been an EU uh, a priority. Um, in probably in the last uh, uh, elections and previous to that, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, public misconceptions about enlargement. And, and when people think about enlargement, they assume immediately uh, immigration and, and bringing uh, or taking jobs away from, from our people. And that's why you're getting a lot of uh, anti-enlargement sentiments in places like Germany or UK um, uh, or, or Austria and others, but then you, uh, you'll you notice the complete opposite is that in some countries that public perception, uh, public perception is so low, the governments are actually the, one of the biggest proponents of uh, in, in enlargement, like the e UK, um, although there is the negative uh, perception. Uh, the other thing is, uh, which we have found concerning in, in the most recent months is that uh, the new commission president, uh, uh, Juncker, has stated that enlargement will not be, we will not have any enlargement uh, of the EU in the next five years, which actually immediately the people in the region and the, and the, and the governments are saying, well, the EU doesn't care uh, so much about uh, our, our countries, why should we uh, do the reforms process? And then, you know, uh, I guess 
to uh, as a direct response to that, Serbia, for example, uh, said that no matter what uh, the EU has said or what they're saying, we're going to continue on our rigorous uh, reforms agenda and try to meet those reforms by 2018, 2019. Um, I just want to, uh, in conclusion, so uh, just so you all know where all the countries stand, uh, Albania uh, was granted candidate status in uh, June of this year. Bosnia, unfortunately, has been stalled due to the implementation of the Sadic Finci case regarding discrimination against citizens on the grounds of ethnicity. Uh, Kosovo's stabilization and association agreement was initialed but has not been signed, and unfortunately, five EU states do not recognize uh, the country's independence. However, despite this, Kosovo remains very committed to EU membership. Macedonia was one of the first countries actually to sign the stabilization and association agreement with the EU in 2001, even before Croatia. Um, became uh, a candidate status in December 2005. Uh, the EU Commission said that they met all the requirements for starting accession negotiations. However, due to uh, its differences with Greece or Greece's differences over Macedonia's name, the country has been blocked from progressing further. Montenegro, which wasn't discussed, uh, is a candidate uh, country since 2010 and started accession negotiates in, in negotiations in June of 2012. And then Serbia, uh, which is a candidate uh, since March of 2012, uh, started its accession negotiations this past January. So, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, and, uh, given uh, the work that you do at the Odyssey Democratization and Development of Rule of Law, um, what's the interplay with accession? Is it a hindrance? Is it an incentive? Do people care? Again, three minutes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. Um, I think it's interesting and useful to have these discussions. Um, a disclaimer, I'm not here as a U.S. government um, official. I'm here as a private individual, so whatever I say is my private opinion and cannot be attributed to the U.S. government. <laughs> um, to answer your question, there are several parts to it. Um, in terms of the incentives, um, as you know, the overall U.S. government policy in, in the Balkans and elsewhere um, has been a Euro-Atlantic integration, um, integration into NATO and EU, and that comes with um, a number of very specific standards that these countries must meet in order to become members. Um, so is that a factor? Definitely it is a factor. Um, it's a factor because it provides a roadmap, and um, all of us essentially are contributing to um, um, helping these countries to meet certain standards and progress along this roadmap so they can become candidate countries and eventually um, EU members and so forth. Um, how much of it is an incentive? Um, I think it is debatable if you look at the literature um, and also the experience of the countries that have been graduated and the countries that are on the path to become members. I think the record is quite uneven. Um, and there are periods you kind of you need to look um, along this certain continuum and see where these countries were um, in the process to see how effective, say, EU integration can be um, in terms of justice sector reforms. And I think it is quite effective initially um, when certain things need to be in place, uh, put, put, put in place, like the legal structure and certain standards that must be met and so forth. Um, if you look at the Freedom House data, and unfortunately what we all confront here, you at ABA and us in the U.S. government and elsewhere, is that um, we don't really have a clear understanding of what happens as those countries transition and have been transitioning over the past 20 years because uh, um, I know I'm, not, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm not, uh, I don't have a Ph.D. in anything. So, but I know that we do need to have certain data in place in order to be able to trace the progress along the continuum. And uh, we don't really have means to collect this data across the board. So you basically have this. Uh, Why not? Um, that's a good question. I guess because there are too many of us uh, who are working in this area. And I think it's also because the countries that um, transitioned over the 90s and became, say, EU members, like Poland and the Baltics and so forth, what I discovered several years ago is that um, the data that we were collecting back, back then, well, A, we don't continue tracking those countries as they graduate mm -hmm. and say, um, you know, we cannot say, well, five years after they graduated or 10 years after they graduated, 
this is what has happened um, with the types of things that uh, they received as the result of EU or US government assistance. Um, and also the data that we were collecting in the 90s, um, not just USAID, but across the board, is not necessarily comparable or compatible to the data that's being collected now. So it's very difficult to say, well, empirically, this is what happens. Um, but is it effective? Yes. Is it effective? Sometimes it is effective. Um, what happens to the countries after they become EU members, and I guess we can look at Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, and so forth, um, and in the countries where, say, Freedom House still collects that data, um, it's kind of stagnant. It, they pretty much stay at the same level. But maybe we can get later into why that happens. Yeah, and uh, post-accession, some countries are still under what I would call surveillance mm -hmm. uh, to their great chagrin. Um, but whether it really prompts further reforms, it's quite unclear also. And again, we don't have the data. Since you've been involved, Mary, on uh, a number of reforms, including the criminal codes, the criminal procedure codes, um, to what extent, uh, again, is accession or the possibility of accession um, an approach, a strategy that helps for productive reforms or are people resentful of some of the guidelines that they're supposed to adhere to? What's your sense of what's going on? Well, I, um, I think as Betsy alluded to, it's a mixed picture. My, my litmus tests are, in the criminal justice reform area, are communities safer? Are the rights of victims and the accused being protected better, the human rights and due process rights? And then what's the public perception? Does, does the public really believe in their criminal justice system? Do they believe that if they've been a victim of a crime, that if they report that crime, that just things will happen? Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, if they have a family member, thank you. If they have a family member that is um, an accused or a victim, you know, is it their perception that things are going to be better? And as you mentioned, Madeline, a lot of the criminal reform that has gone on globally, including in accession countries, has been criminal code amendments and complete overhauls of the criminal procedure code. And I think a lot of us feel like the overhauls have, have happened, the, the legislation has been thoughtfully drafted, and the overhauls, the, the legislative frameworks are, are pretty good. It's you know where the rubber re meets the road is the implementation. And you have to also remember that this is just a sea change, a cultural sea change for these criminal justice actors. Judges are now out of the investigation business and they're intended to be neutral arbiters. And that's hard for them, yeah. you know? And prosecutors, the same um, prosecutors in many of the countries, including the Balkan countries, are now uh, supposed to be leading investigations with agencies that they're not in charge with. And I've lived that life. If you're not in charge of the ability to discipline or to um, have kind of a hard conversation with an investigative agency where you're not getting the evidence you need, I mean, there you are. Um, so, and remember in at least Serbia and in Bosnia, a lot of these criminal justice professionals, the judges and the prosecutors have had to reapply for their jobs. They've gone through a reappointment process. And so they're being asked to assume newer and different duties, and they're afraid for their jobs. Yeah, and uh, I've noticed also as we work um, globally, uh, for example, in Latin America, in some countries, they have tried to move to what they call more of an adversarial system, mm -hmm. which very often simply means that the uh, uh, sessions are public. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some countries where there is overhaul uh, of the criminal procedures, the law schools are still teaching the old methods. Mm -hmm and they're clueless when they engage in their profession what this new stuff is mm -hmm. about. And so the implementation, I mean, in general, and I, I want you to, uh, Serenity, to very often the international or regional norms, uh, the directives from the European Union, uh, even the uh, national laws are pretty decent and it's really implementation which is, could take almost a generation or two generations to be successful. So uh, f from, your, uh, from your perspective, as you oversee uh, some programs in various countries, uh, to what extent are those changes within the European context um, difficult to, strat to impede strategies and how does the American system interplay with this very different model uh, of 
doing justice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not an easy question <laughs> to answer. Um, yes, this is not supposed to be an easy panel. Absolutely. I don't know if Mary yeah. told her. Um, you know, I and are Americans aware of those European mm -hmm. standards in general? I, I think generally they are. Um, what I have to say, I, I bring kind of an interesting baggage into this, being um, a comparativist, not just by virtue of my education, by the fact that I am an American lawyer and I'm also a Russian lawyer. Um, and I did practice criminal law about 20 years ago. Wow. Um, so, you know, we can look at this reforms from a very technocratic point of view, and I think we've done that. Um, the World Bank does that, we do it, uh, State Department does it, everybody does it, right? Because we basically need to say, okay, this is what the country needs to have in our opinion. And then it could be whatever that is. And yes, ultimately, it is a question of implementation. Um, but also, there has to be an incredible change in the culture as well, right? Yeah. And the kinds of norms that we tend to introduce from the American point of view that are kind of based on common law and so forth, um, there's a very strong element of uh, democracy in all of this, right? Because common law by, by its nature, it's democratic and that's how it evolved over the past uh, thousand years. Um, so to me, the effectiveness of those reforms and the implementation and so forth, it's a very complex um, package where it's not just what we do legally, but other things need to move as well. There need to be changes on the civil society side, there need to be changes on the democracy side, there need to be changes everywhere. Because rule of law, and again, if you look at the academic literature, um, you know, Lenz and who, whatever, um, people who wrote on these types of topics, rule of law is an underpin, it's an underline, it's a foundation of what we call a liberal democracy. And uh, from our point of view, this is what we've been promoting in Eastern Europe for the past 20 years. It's a very specific model, it's called liberal democracy. And liberal democracy is based on the fact that there is rule of law, there needs to be a presence of rule of law. Um, and that's where I think it gets really tricky because it has been an incredibly complex project for those countries and us as outsiders coming into these systems and into these places which are undergoing incredible changes, right? Moving from communism to democracy, uh, going from a variety of cultural and historic perspectives into something that um, has been commonly accepted in the West for centuries, right? There's a huge transition that has taken place and if we just look at legal assistance in terms of what is done technocratically and technically, that's just a small piece of a huge puzzle. And in that puzzle, a lot of pieces need to come together almost at the same time, and it's a complex exercise. A related question, then I will turn to Victor. Um, my experience is that donors tend to, and particularly Americans, mm -hmm. but also Europeans, tend to be very impatient. Mm -hmm. uh, they have sort of a template, what needs to be done, over what period of time, who's supposed to be involved in the change, and since you're talking about cultural shift, that can take generations, do you find in your agency, and you don't have to answer if this is embarrassing, no, but you find in your agency whether there is an understanding, an appreciation of how long those cultural shifts take? What is your best argument to explain why one should be patient? Right. Or is it kind of hopeless? Oh my goodness, um, all of the above. All of the um, above, okay, may I feel <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think there's definitely an appreciation um, within USA even um, that you know it is a long-term project um, and it does take a lot of time and we can only assist up to a certain point. But then the hope is that at some point there will be a local ownership right of what needs to be done and with the idea that it will take perhaps generations to get from point A to point B. USAID, just like any other donor organization, we're driven by budgets, right? Mm -hmm. And we're driven by certain cycles. Um, and we think in terms of certain periods of time. So, um, you know, as an officer, I'm assigned to a country for a period of time. Um, my project can be five years, it can be three years, it can be four years. And, you know, I need to think in terms of what can be accomplished in that period of time. Granted that I can be in a country which is going through incredible political changes. Um, and things are moving, everything is moving at the same time and here I am with my project trying to accomplish mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. 
and that may not be an opportune moment for that. Or it may be a country in a complete stalemate where nothing is happening. Yeah. And we have examples of that when nothing can be accomplished. And still you have that period of three to five years to do something. So it requires a lot of creative thinking, but also we're driven by those uh, considerations that are external to those countries, that are internal to us. Um, but that's just the way it is, right? Um, and you have to basically figure out how, what can you do given those constraints um, that I may be present in this country for five to 10, 15 years, sometimes longer, uh, but it's a definite period of time. And within that definite period of time, you need, you need to set your objectives clearly with an understanding that it is going to be an unfinished business. Which relates to a question I'd like to ask you, Mitya. Uh, in order for those fundamental shifts, uh, changing the culture, shifts, uh, changes in the process, including the bureaucracy, I would think that a critical element is the support from the public or from the citizenry. And my sense is very often they don't really know what's going on. They're still very dissatisfied with the status quo. They mm -hmm. still see that things are either dysfunctional or unfair or not equitable. How do you master public support or what is your sense of the support of the citizenry in the region? And how can, what, do, what would be the most effective strategies to gather that support? If Over, at all possible. Overall, or EU, or uh, for legal reforms, or? For, for criminal justice reform uh, in the Balkan. Well, do people uh, care? I mean, I'm, I'm sure people do care. <laughs> okay. uh, you, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think everybody wants a, a great uh, future ahead of them. And, and given the culture of, uh, of these countries of being a, uh, you know, coming from a communist uh, mentality, like one of the speakers in the video from Albania uh, stated, and, and shifting that, uh, you know, uh, mindset into this uh, pro-democracy uh, building. And, and I think uh, for more or less, given what Mary said, I think the, the, framework, uh, the, the framework there exists in, in the region. But I think that, uh, one, it has to be a clear priority of, of all the governments um, and societies involved. I think the media plays a, uh, an enormous uh, role in, in shaping public perception, and particularly, you know, for example, there was a, a, a case in, in Macedonia that came out this year uh, that was very ethnic-driven, um, and um, the, me the media painted it as ethnic-driven and not a case of uh, uh, folks that were found guilty of killing another group of uh, uh, individuals, and the media shaped it as an ethnic, and then uh, one side of society that belonged to this ethnic group immediately lost faith in uh, the judicial system, mm -hmm. um, and, and immediately painted that the government is trying to uh, turn this into a, a, an ethnic, and especially in countries that the media is primarily controlled by uh, the government, or the best uh, uh, media are controlled by the government, and there's a, a not enough access to independent or both sides. Uh, you know, I think has has definitely um, helped uh, or not helped in why the perception of the public uh, is such. But I think uh, you know, uh, people's uh, I guess uh, if I can if I can use their trust um, in in judges and lawyers. Uh, in the system is not there uh, quite yet. Uh, you know, obviously in America, you know, we've had uh, a couple of hundred years to work on uh, perfecting the uh, the system and ensuring that there is a trust. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, these days there's a little bit of debate. Yeah. Yes, yes, but um, but I think for the for the most part, there's still a, a huge lack of trust in the system, um, in the government, and that's why. You know, governments fall regularly in the Balkans, and there's elections every few years uh, because of many of this. And we've noticed uh, the main obstacle of the, uh, of the system in the Balkans, particularly when it comes to economic reforms, which many of these countries significantly need, and, and investments, is the lack of or no trust uh, in the system, and, and also the fact that the system is still not perfect uh, in order to allow more uh, more foreign direct investments in the country, for example. So. Yeah, and going back to you, Mary, um, again, I'm thinking about public perception, cultural shift, um, the length, the, the long time that it takes for those things to evolve. 
um, thinking about uh, access to representation mm -hmm. from the earliest days, uh, my sense, including in the United States, that the general public doesn't give a hoot about criminal mm -hmm. defendants. Uh, they're there because they're guilty anyway. Unless it's their son. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Remembering uh, uh, therapeutic communities back in the 60s in the US when the, the kids of the middle class started getting busted for grass, uh, suddenly, <gasps> in prison, my child, absolutely not. But, but uh, what, what are, in, in, uh, in your view, some of the better ways to inform the public to support access to representation? It, do you personalize it? Uh, do you dramatize it? Uh, do you involve some, what I would call, change agents, whether it's bar associations or advocacy people? I mean, how, mm -hmm. What works? Well, I think, you know, a couple of things concern me, and you mentioned it earlier in your opening remarks, is there's this remaining default toward pretrial detention. There's the, okay, we think there's a crime been, that's been committed, let's um, grab someone, incarcerate them, and we'll sort it out later kind of thing. And that makes, you know, Ashley and Jesse's comments in this whole project are about empowering um, the competency and status of the bar. Um, and that's real critical when you're in countries where there's still this default toward detention and um, conviction by confession and a lack of willingness to allot resources toward um, better investigative skills and training and addressing the problems with cooperation between police and prosecutors. It's my understanding that there's a real resistance in, in most governments in the countries we work to have kind of a national level legal aid scheme, for lack of a better description. It's my understanding in the Balkans that we're still working off lists of lawyers who volunteer to be assigned to an accused who, again, is languishing in detention, whether they've been identified as, as an accused, and if they've been identified as an accused, then there's still that, um, that level of immediacy in, in, um, in getting an attorney um, access to his or her client. Um, and you know, the, the renovations of these criminal procedure codes are allowing the defense bar to have more involvement in preparing the defense. Um, some of the countries are uh, allowing that the defense can secure their own experts, but then again, back to the problem with resources or any systemization of that, there's no resources to pay for those experts. So that you may have the right uh, to have your attorney who's been appointed and may get paid eventually to go ahead and do their own forensic analysis, but it, it ain't happening. Yeah, and in uh, <clears throat> looking at access to representation, particularly um, whether it's a legal aid scheme uh, or free assistance, uh, the perennial complaint is we're not paid enough. Mm -hmm. um, in some countries, there is no pro bono tradition, mm -hmm. or it's pro bono is called in some countries where I've worked uh, being paid by the state, mm -hmm. uh, which of course means uh, pittance um, and really affects the quality of representation. Is there a way, as you look at some of your programs, is there a way to deal with that issue or is it, it will always be a flaw in the system, which is that the, the uh, equal arms of defense versus prosecution are gonna be uneven and we deal with it. And, and you find a difference between accession countries and non-accession countries in that regard. Um, I don't, it's a tough question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, just before I answer this, I, I think we often tend to forget that here in the United States, um, justice sector reform is an ongoing project and has been ongoing for now two centuries plus. Um, and I recommend anyone who works in the criminal justice sector, and actually put a note here to tell you, there's a, I think, brilliant book by William Stuntz on the collapse of the American criminal justice system that I think Justice Stevens reviewed three years ago, just before. Um, By William? William Stuntz. Stuntz. Uh, he's a late, yeah, late Harvard law professor. Um, and, and it's clear there are lots of things that are going on here um, that <coughs> we have to be thinking about all the time, right? The way the criminal justice evolved in this country and where it's going and the problems so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, 
we can't just uh, take what we have here and elsewhere and then just... Uh, but some have tried. We have tried, yeah. And, and the irony, of course, is that it all began in the 60s with law and development, right? And that was yep. the basic premise behind it. Mm -hmm. And it's been 50 years, and sometimes we do exact same thing. We take what we think works here, and then we transplant it elsewhere, and of course it doesn't work because it's just not going to work. Yeah, and transplants generally get rejected when it's not done well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But um, in terms of um, equality of arms, I, I think this is something that will evolve over time. Um, but again, we look at this from the perspective that, well, if we go to a Balkan country and both the judges and sometimes the defense bar and sometimes the prosecutors are part of the same ministry, Ministry of Justice, right? And um, that is not right. They need to be separate. They need to be independent. And that's one way to look at it. And, you know, we're basically doing whatever we, we can do to separate them and make them independent. And sometimes they physically and legally become independent of each other but mentally they're still working towards the same objective. And that's what I confronted as an attorney lots of years ago. And when I go to these countries, I still see that. Um, I think someone was talking about the acquittal rate, which you know, is 1% sometimes um, in most of these places. Um, and you're still in the system where the prosecutor tends to dominate the system, even though technically the defense bar may be independent yeah. and has certain equality. And that's, again, it's, I think we're going back to the question of culture. I mean, that's something that I think will change over time. Um, and it will change because, you know, these reforms, which are first internal and they're driven by, say, the judiciary or they're driven by the defense bar or they're driven by the prosecutors and so forth. Um, but at some point, uh, once there's a certain demand and, you know, the criminal justice, it affects people, right? It affects people's lives. And, and it's inevitable that at some point people are going to demand better justice. Right. People are going to start asking questions. Um, and I don't know when that people reach that point, but I think it's inevitable. Um, and of course, there are organizations, various NGOs and so forth, that litigate those cases in you know, European Court of Human Rights and so forth. So there's, there's some external pressure um, on the governments to change, uh, to change things. But again, it's an ongoing process, and, uh, and the cultural um, part of it cannot be dismissed. Yeah, to use the well. cliche, it's not a sprint, it's, uh, it's not a marathon, it's a long run, yeah. Yeah. Um, Jog. Which sort of deals with a question which I would like to ask both uh, Reto and Mary to, to answer. Um, we've been uh, talking a little bit about defense, lack of resources, still evolving, uh, and doesn't have much public support so far. What about the judges, what about the prosecutors, and what about corruption and real independence? In other words, these are some of the pillars of implementing the statutes or legislation mm -hmm. uh, reforms. Uh, what have been your observations of the extent to which judges and prosecutors are truly independent? To what extent there is uh, hidden influence, uh, arm twisting, and does corruption continue to play a role? And how do we deal with that? I'm asking you, and then I'll ask Mary. Sure. Um, well, I, I highly recommend if anybody's uh, very interested in, in, in this to obviously look at the progress reports on all the countries uh, in the region from, from the European Union, which detail, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the areas that there needs to be improvement on, particularly in, in fighting uh, corruption. I think, uh, you know, the, the independence and the comp competence of the courts needs to be uh, further enhanced, obviously, and 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 more focus uh, on the on the quality of justice provided uh, to the to the citizen. And you know, corruption is actually one of the uh, main problems uh, in, in in many of the areas, and and continues to be a serious problem. You know, for for example, in in Macedonia, I just discovered I I, I didn't know that the total number of judges remains more than. 50% higher than the European average in relation to the size of the population. Mm -hmm. And so thus efficiency. Um, and, and again, that back to that trust. Why are there so many judges? Why is so much money being spent on judges? And I think that, you know, uh, the, the there needs to be a lot more uh, focus. And, and this is where, you know, 
when you open up the, the chapters, the negotiation chapters uh, of the EU, you actually then make sure or you're, you're uh, going back and forth and checks and balances between the EU and these countries to, uh, to implement these reforms. And, you know, by stalling uh, negotiations, uh, it uh, allows the domestic uh, uh, governments or the populace uh, to continue the way they've always continued. Um, and unfortunately, and, and back to, uh, you know, the, the public perception, if, the, if, you know, the government is probably the largest employers in these countries when it comes to public administration uh, and other areas, again, the trust. Um, and I think that uh, more resources need to be d devoted. Um, and also... Um, more the, resources for what? I mean, you said for... Well, for, uh, for the efficiency uh, of these courts, but not in hiring uh, or furthering judges uh, in, in that area, but obviously decreasing uh, the, the black backlogs of, of cases um, giving more resources to, uh, I guess, local courts uh, in, in order to process these cases instead of bringing them to the, to the head courts in Skopje, for example, in, in, in Macedonia. Uh, but the other, uh, the other thing is also the education system and, and uh, the lawyers. And, you know, I, I noticed there was a, a new law university opened up, and I'm like, is there a need for, uh, you know, that many lawyers in the, in the country? And, and sorry, ABA, yes, there is definitely a, a need for more lawyers, but, you know, more lawyers just for the sake of lawyers or more lawyers uh, to really process uh, cases and and uh, give uh, uh, due process or allow due process with the, with the system uh, to to their clients. But the other thing is selective processing of the high profile cases, and unfortunately, that has been a common occurrence in the Balkans. And you know the the civil society in the media and the citizens play a key role uh, in this. And for example, in in Albania. Uh, and Kosovo social media has been used to basically, uh, you know, I I express the sentiments of the citizens in, in terms of where they see certain government officials and what they're doing. And fortunately, nobody's trying these individuals um, because they're somewhat immune in the system because they are a government official. And I think that's, uh, you know, common among, across the board in the Balkans and not just in one specific country over another. Yeah, that just reminds me, before I turn to you, Mary, it, it, it reminds me that, uh, as I remember, I, I, I think it's still happening, in France, uh, magistrates, whether they be judges, uh, investigating judges or prosecutors, must rotate. They cannot stay mm -hmm. in the same place uh, mm -hmm. forever mm -hmm. and be part of the um, elite of that community and therefore favor Mm -hmm. Their interests, they, yes. are, they are obliged to every five years or six years or whatever mm -hmm. to rotate to a different court or different part of mm -hmm. France. Not a sinecure, but mm -hmm. one, one aspect. So when's, what's your sense of real independence or is it still very much under the thumb of the executive or, uh, or, or the people in favor of status quo and what about corruption and how do you deal with it? Well, I'd love to see more technical assistance <coughs> Seren and or Andrea, I know is here. <laughs> I'd love to see more targeted technical assistance to provide, um, to help the judicial superior councils and the prosecutorial superior councils. Mm -hmm. Most of the countries have these intended to be independent quasi-official bodies that are in charge of the appointment, uh, you know, transfers, as you mentioned, Madeline. Uh, and, the, and the other big thing, the other big elephant in the room is disciplining. Um, you know, uh, enforcing ethics codes that are well drafted and fair and transparently implemented. And I, I, you know, my perception is, is that I think the judicial councils are kind of the, the first starters, but the prosecutorial councils are, are not quite there yet. And again, when we're talking about corruption, it's you giving, the, giving the prosecutors and the judges the cover to do their jobs so that you know that their job, if they do their jobs like they're supposed to do their jobs, then these, you know, they can, they can go ahead and, and make some of these tougher decisions, especially the higher level corruption cases, the, the prosecutions that are not happening 
Um, but the, the, the superior councils are, I think, sometimes just, and my colleague Simon was just in Moldova um, doing a, a needs assessment, and you know, it, that, that, that prosecutorial council um, is, is kind of in startup mode and, and really hopefully will get some targeted technical assistance. Yeah, I remember in Romania that uh, uh, as part of our work, um, we looked at the code of ethics mm -hmm. and we developed uh, case studies uh, asking uh, judges or magistrates, uh, given the case study, what should be the decision? Was it a violation? Was it not a violation? And we found something really j quite wonderful, which was that many said, I never really thought about those issues. Hmm. Uh, it's there, yeah, I try to be honest, whatever, but I never thought in depth how to analyze that issue, whether it was a conflict of interest, whether it's a, an ethic breach. Uh, but it can also go the other way. I mean, reforms are non-ending, uh, because in Italy, for example, independence of judges ran amok. Hmm. I mean, they became their little empire, empire accountable only to themselves, and then we can have the reverse problem uh, mm -hmm. developing. Mm -hmm. And what, what has been, in your view, uh, some of the more successful uh, tactics to deal with corruption? Do, does any example come to mind in the region? I think one of my colleagues mentioned it. I, I think you have to be um, knowing that corruption cases, are, whether it's whether you're addressing corruption within the judiciary or within the criminal justice system, or if you're addressing public corruption, they're tough cases, and I don't need to necessarily explain why. But you have to be very targeted in, in kind of how you address it and, and, and who you kind of go after. And again, back to some of the novelties with the new criminal procedure code overhauls, um, many countries are now instituting a form of plea bargaining, which is um, something that I can't imagine practicing criminal justice in my own country without the opportunity for plea bargaining to ensure a certain result, to craft a situation where you can use testimony from co-accused to firm a, a, a firmer foundation for the individual who's who's the most corrupt, yeah. um, and you know better surveillance, undercover techniques. Those are some of the things that have gone in these criminal procedure codes that are still being um, implemented. Yeah, and it's, and it's also, I mean, I, I remember doing some work in Latin America uh, about 20 years ago, and one of the issues that we were pondering was how do you deal with corruption when in the country there's a culture of corruption? Mm -hmm. It's standard corruption that you have to drive to get to the doctor, that you have to pay the professor to get good grades. So within the context of general acceptance of corruption as a way to live and survive, then it makes it even harder to, mm -hmm. to fight it because you need certain support. I would like to turn to all of you who are patiently listening to this conversation. So let me ask one final question from each of you. Uh, what is, in your view, the most exciting development and what is your biggest worry? Think about it for a second. Mary, why don't you start? I'm excited to hear that in Macedonia, uh, there's more public access to information, um, court information. I, you know, years ago when we were working in Uzbekistan, we worked on a, we had a court recording proje project because we, we, we've all learned that not everything in court is transcribed like we're used to having and, and then there's no record and there's mm -hmm. not something sufficient to appeal from. Not only did that create a situation where there was a better record, but people started coming to court and watching what was going on and I feel like the more Beach soap operas. Yeah. The, the more public education and the more access to information, the, the functioning of the ombuds people, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of the uh, work I've done in, in assessments in the last few years is people don't really understand it happens in the United States. They don't under really understand where to go for certain issues, um, and really why, if a criminal case is being considered, why it's not appropriate to go on down that road, and no one talks to them. There's no victim advocacy or uh, well, just insufficient victim advocacy. So that's, to me, one of the most exciting. The biggest worry? Um, I'm still concerned about how attorneys are being um, appointed. They're not, not in a systemic um, uh, fashion yes. and not in a way that allows for evaluation and any kind of monitoring of competence, and that's, that's worrying. John? Um, 
Well, I guess when I go from country to country in uh, the uh, Europe and Eurasia region, what really excites me is the fact that um, we have a cadre of people now who actually care about these issues. Mm -hmm. And we can find the like-minded individuals pretty much in every country we go to. Uh, people who do want to improve uh, their lives, uh, the quality of the criminal justice system, who do want to help people around them and so forth. And I think that's a greatest uh, motivator uh, for all of us who work in this area. Because you mean civil society or within the government institutions or both? Sometimes within the government, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times outside of the government. And I believe that um, those reforms cannot be insular. Um, I think they need to be an outside pressure although you have to be cognizant of the fact that, yes, you need to have independence as well. Um, but there needs to be a demand, and demand will come from the outside. If you look at the way the court system in the United States was reformed, um, it's been a long and painful process, and we have to remember that. Um, and then, what was biggest, on the next? Biggest piece? worry. Oh, what? biggest worry. Um, biggest worry is the fact that uh, there's a lot of corruption in all these countries. So that is a major factor, and it's a major concern. And if we look at what happened in Ukraine, uh, what happened in, uh, during the Arab Spring and so forth, and uh, the role that corruption played in those processes, uh, or the reaction to corruption, um, that's I think, is important. It's something that we need to think about very carefully in how we factor it into what we do. Um, and the fact that uh, there's a backsliding across the board um, in Eastern Europe on a number of very important issues. Um, you know, the emergence of this illiberal democracy talk in mm -hmm. Hungary, for example. Um, in other countries uh, were things that we kind of thought we were done, but it's kind of going a little bit backwards. Um, and that worries me because of other developments in Europe um, on the Eastern Front, uh, quite literally, um, and how it is all connected. I mean, that's something we need to be aware of um, because, you know, we're in business of enabling people to lead normal lives. Um, and that's where the institutions come and play their role. And that's the sole reason why those institutions exist in a democracy uh, to serve the needs of the people um, and to ensure the protections um, of the majorities and minorities, whatnot. And, and this backsliding, it is a disturbing friend, uh, trend, and uh, it certainly worries all of us start first with the, the biggest worries. I think uh, Saran and, and Mary nailed it. Uh, just to just to add to that is this uh, the, the lack of a promise of NATO and EU enlargement. Uh, and, and given that rule of law is such a crucial uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of both institutions, uh, the fact that uh, we are not going full force on it like we did in the early 90s or the last wave uh, of, of enlargement, I think that, you know, is, is worrisome. I think the, the fact that we're allowing uh, the void on certain sectors to be filled by other countries that uh, may not be uh, as, uh, as uh, democratic as we would like them to be. Um, uh, we'll definitely see what happens this uh, winter with uh, energy security uh, and, and whatnot. And I think this is where the last summit uh, of NATO could have delved uh, into some of these issues. And I hope that the EU summit coming up uh, in December will also deal on some of these issues. Uh, that promise of being part of the Western uh, uh, community, uh, the Western family uh, of nations. And a lot of these countries in, uh, in the Balkans uh, really want to be part of that. Um, and then I guess the- I'm sorry? To Mr. Putin's chagrin. Yes, <laughs> and um, and I, I think on the on the positive aspect, I think is that you know we're seeing a lot of commonalities uh, among the the people of the of the countries uh, involved, and then also the regional cooperation. Uh, that I'm very pleased to see uh, becoming more and more common, uh, particularly like what was shown in the video uh, on legal and judicial reforms, but also economic development, human rights, uh, civil society, and other areas that I think that regional uh, cooperation is, is crucial. Uh, because, you know, these countries are way too small. The market's too small in, in, in each, and I think going together uh, on their path to where they need to be, I think, is the key. And I, I'm very optimistic that, you know, soon that will come. But I think it's that generational change that's needed, uh, a n you know, new generations coming that were not raised or grew up in communist Yugoslavia or Albania 
uh, or whatnot and, and start looking at um, you know, the, the future, but obviously access needs to be granted and that's where EU and NATO come into play and why it's so important for these countries to be part of that family. So, so thank you guys. Uh, what about you? Who has questions? You and then you and is there a microphone or? And would you mind saying who you are? Yes. Is it working? Yes. Uh, my name is Elena and I work for the ABA Center for Human Rights. Um, so my question is a little bit broader than the Balkans, but I think especially you mentioned Serbia. Perhaps it can be informed by the experience in the Balkans. Um, if you remove outside motivators, for example, joining Europe, then what do you see as the biggest contributors to sort of internal motivators towards instituting these reforms or broader reforms or cultural change? So I'm asking if you remove the biggest carrot and stick situation mm -hmm. that you have, what are the other ones internally? Who wants to answer? Take a somewhat of a, a, of a stab, I think, um, you know, the, this year marks the 100th anniversary of uh, World War I, and, and we know how it started uh, in Sarajevo, and, and the Balkans have been, you know, overturn, overtorn uh, by wars and ethnic conflicts and, and things like that. So I think it's in the best interest of, uh, of these countries to reform for the sake of reforming their countries, uh, you know, their, their societies. I think what happened, what's happening in Bosnia, the fact that, you know, there was this, the international actors being involved in Bosnia, and we formed this constitution that we thought was perfect, but unfortunately it's not perfect. And actually one of the main hurdles of Bosnia from going forward is because of those uh, constitutional reforms that were done in the 90s, particularly the fact that you cannot, uh, you have to be Croatian, Serbian, or Bosniak in order to be uh, the head. What happens if you're of Jewish heritage, uh, religious background, or another uh, ethnic uh, or religious group? You know, you can't rise up uh, the ranks, I guess, to, and, and so it's in the best interest uh, for these countries to reform. Um, they, you know, I think everybody wants their citizens uh, idealistically to be in a better position. And, uh, you know, by reforming society, um, by ensuring trust uh, in the system, you're gonna, and, and stability, I think, is gonna bring in more foreign direct investment. Then the people are gonna become, you know, I mean, in, in countries like Macedonia, the average salary is about 300 euros a month. Um, and, and that's why you're seeing this huge brain drain uh, of folks leaving the country for better opportunities, and then <coughs> sooner or later, you're gonna have the same problem of, of Western Europe, is where are all the youth? Yeah. And when you started in the early 90s, which, uh, which I mean, more than 60% of the populations were young, under the age of 35, or even under you know 25, now you're seeing a growing elderly population. So I think uh, you know countries need to re-strategize, um, and, and yes, EU and NATO is a, um, uh, is I guess a carrot, um, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's really, uh, I think that the true want uh, by government, civil society, and everybody that we really need to get our act together. Um, I won't use any other word <laughs> than we were discussing before, but you know, uh, so I, I, I'm optimistic, and, and I think that's uh, from, from that perspective, being somebody from, Macedonian heritage born in, in, in America and having those opportunities. Fortunately, people back there do, are not offered the same opportunities and they're gonna start wondering why and then they're gonna start leaving. And that's why visa liberalization and other uh, mechanisms uh, are so so key and tourism and, and broadening your horizons and this is where ABA and others come into play because you're showcasing um, a better system, a better uh, way of doing things uh, that you're not accustomed to. So Let me turn to the other question. Sorry, we can ask it if you want to. So is this on? Okay. Um, Chris Anderson, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, so I have two questions. The first one has to do with the media and journalism. Are there things that the media is missing? That, 
both the media and journalists uh, opportunities that we are missing that we could also um, make use of and, and sort of help inform the public and so forth from your perspective. Um, and then my second question has to do with something that you've all touched on sort of tangentially and that is uh, data and um, technology. Are there opportunities there that um, if, there, if you had a wish list of uh, access to technology that you would say this could be very helpful in helping us forward with the kinds of things that we're doing either in terms of communication or in terms of record keeping and reporting uh, to the general public or making more documents open, more information, more education on these issues available to the general public in the various countries. Um, I'm going to turn to my colleagues, but one, one thing about information technologies. <coughs> so many countries have tried to incorporate those wonderful electronic case file management stuff with wasted money, including countries that don't have electricity, so how are you going to operate a computer? Uh, and I think some reassessment of how, when, at what, uh, on what basis do you introduce improved case management systems and should they be all electronic? Huge millions have been spent and the computers are sitting on tables or in a, in a corner, so that's good. But do you want, do you want to answer? Uh, sure, um, I can try. Media um, and information technology. I think media and journalism play an important role in the process. And in the Balkans, we have this, I think, fabulous project. It's called Balkans Investigative Journalism yeah. um, Program or Project. Um, and this, they do a great job. They expose corruption in the government. Um, I think it, it, you know, occasionally you can read about it in the Post, and you can read about it in the New York Times and other newspapers. You can read about it in Nizavisima Gazeta in Russia. And, uh, say, um, various schemes that are being used in Moldova, Russia, and then Eastern Europe to um, channel certain things, et cetera. Um, so yeah, um, they are part of it, um, and um, an important part of it, because someone does need to investigate, and investigative journalism is certainly a big, um, plays a big role in the process as well, bringing attention to the issues that are out there. Um, whether um, what the investigative journalism investigate and whether that translates into uh, a systemic institutional change, that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. I think that gets, that's where it gets a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. um, on the use of technology, yeah, I think technology plays a big role. It's being integrated, but you're right. Um, often we don't see that working. Um, but the idea is, you know, you basically look at the issue of transparency, say, in the judiciary by uh, virtue of introducing technology, but also introducing processes and procedures that are clear, transparent, and so forth. Um, so technology can be a part of it. Um, you know, you automated case management system, or you know, e-filing, or in those kiosks when you can find out where uh, your case is in the process, and so forth. I mean, this is, these are all helpful tools, um, but they need to be a part of something else. I want to briefly answer your question, though. Um, you know, I think EU integration is incredibly important. Um, and it's a, it's a road map. And if you look further east, if you look to Ukraine, if you look to uh, Russia, if you look to the Caucasus and so forth, yeah, yeah, you see that the countries are stuck. Um, and there's really no progress there because kind of reforms are done in the abstract and they have become technocratic exercises for the elites. Uh, but that's a very uh, long discussion that can take place. <laughs> Mary, two minutes on the both questions. Oh, I would love to just you know, have a world where the, the media is part of um, the public information and, and the empowerment of the public. Um, what I found when I was in Serbia doing an assessment over the last couple years was that it seems like there's very few media outlets that are um, at a level of professionalism where uh, they're not just kind of fueling the fires and then creating the next prosecution, um, where it's a situation where they're reporting on what's going on and that they're working in tandem with criminal justice actors. And I just think that's critical. It lends credibility to the, me the profession of the media outlets and it lends credibility to the criminal justice system. Um, and on your question, I'm clearly biased, but I think it's technical assistance that really um, keeps providing the momentum for further reforms in countries. You look at the video of the individuals that are part of this Defense Bar Network, 
and you know we've all run into in the course of our careers doing international work we've run into people that just become better legal professionals and and understand they want to be part of something that's not smelly they want to be part of something that's fair and transparent and so i think you know i'm i'm clearly biased but i think it's been the technical assistance and the investment of us implementers and U.S. Uh, funders and the citizens for allowing their tax dollars to be spent that way. Bias is good. Uh, <laughs> Metro, you had uh, you really, wanted to say something about Really quick media. On, the, on the media. Uh, I think the, the problem in the Balkans is that the, the, the largest advertisers uh, of media are government uh, advertised uh, advertisements on government projects and infrastructure and all that stuff. So sometimes I wonder if it's so much media freedom uh, or is it uh, the the journalists and the companies uh, that hire these journalists, obviously the media companies that want to ensure that they continue getting the funds in order to uh, keep funding uh, the work of these journalists. The other thing that I want to uh, point out is I think training of the media, particularly when it comes to witness protection uh, and other areas, uh, because there have been some cases where media uh, have uh, uh, basically outed uh, witnesses uh, which were not supposed to be um, and thus putting in jeopardy the entire case. Um, and and so sometimes it's the government's fault and sometimes it's the uh, uh, the media's uh, fault. But I d and, and then USAID has this wonderful program in addition to the Balkan uh, investigative network that they have is also cross-checking facts. And there's individuals that actually look at all aspects of media on a given story and see which one and how they reported um, and basically going back and saying, well, sorry, this was not the oh, correct so they way. Uh, they do fact checking, um, uh, which is uh, which is fantastic, and I think that is much needed. Um, and because most people take it, you know, there's this you know government agency that distributes the news, and most people take the news and then don't even look at or double uh, check whether that was true or not. And it's always it's always seen as a mouthpiece for the government, but more or less, it's because of time and other. Uh, reasons why uh, they're not doing their uh, fact checking so we're coming close to the famous coffee break so <laughs> I think we have time for one more question do we have one more question you must have one more question <laughs> yeah. and you are my name is Mary Tyson I have a question about, I guess I'm going to need to direct this to Mr. Avan Nessian. I know you're not here representing USAID, but uh, since uh, they are a big funder, to what extent um, do funders uh, appreciate the impact of strategic litigation? Like funding attorneys who are capable of affecting change through essentially lawsuits, civil lawsuits. Um, They've re they're very successful in the U.S. and have been and, and result in a lot of change, for example, in, in pretrial detentions as well, um, or even class action lawsuits. Uh, is that something that USAID looks into? And if so, is there much activity in that area? Uh, the answer is yes, we do. Um, and um, I don't think we have specific activities where that would be the key component. Um, but overall, yes, um, a, a, as a part of a larger project, strategic litigation definitely is one of the things that we're looking at. Um, because that goes back to the issue of incentives, right? I mean, that's one of the incentives, um, finding the groups that, uh, or funding the groups or helping the groups that do litigate particular issues that are of concern um, and so forth. Yeah, it is, it is part of it. Um, there are lots of groups that uh, in the region and beyond that um, bring cases to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and that certainly is part of the uh, strategic litigation approach when uh, um, you know, various issues that do exist in the criminal justice system that are not solved at the local or national level um, end up in the European Court. Um, and then there's a decision that needs to be implemented. Um, although you know, we have a question of implementation that we talked about. Um, but certainly it is, it is part of the overall approach, yes. Um, and it's, it's definitely being factored into the overall thinking. We're, we are aware of it. And if I may weigh in on, on this, uh, quick anecdote. Talking to a French judge a few years ago, a 
about the decision that he had rendered that was in clear contradiction of rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. And his answer, and I will not be profane, uh. but who gives a <laughs> um, <laughs> So one of the things that in, in my organization we are looking at is implementation of judgments. How do you motivate, what kind of change, what kind of advocacy do you need for the, the judiciary to respect precedents, to understand that precedents are a form of obligation to look at against cultures we, who don't really care about the precedential value of former decisions. Did that answer your question? So I want to thank you guys. You've been wonderful. Thank you, uh, thank you for the, I, I learned things, so I, I'm really appreciative. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mabel. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you guys. Thank you.